Okay, so um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, for those who know, don't know me, I'm Renata Gomidi. I'm part of the board of the Alumni Association of Silicon Valley. I've been with the board for um, over four years now, uh, and I lead uh, career, career development. So I've been doing career events. Um, I am an alumna from the Ross Business School. I did my MBA in 2011. Um, finished in 2011, what is already 10 years ago. <laughs> so time really flies. Uh, thank you for, for joining. This is the first uh, event of a series that we're doing. That's how I lead, um, that we're going to be really talking to the C-suite and understanding um, how they got there, how they grown their career. So we can continue to help our alumni community to grow. So today we have here Sumik, uh, he's the chief uh, strategy officer at PECO and shall, he also did his MBA um, at Ross. Awesome. So Sumik, thank you for being here with us. You wanna just say a few words, introduce yourself, tell a little bit more uh, before we start? Absolutely. So first of all, uh, you know, thrilled to be here uh, talking to fellow Wolverines. Go blue, go blue, go blue. I'm not quite wearing a blue t-shirt, you know, there's a little bit of blue in my shirt, but uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. So first of all, Renata, thank you for leading and hosting this forum. It's, you know, it, 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 I'm really looking forward to attending the rest of the series and learning as well and talking. And thank you for all those who made it today. This is always fun for me to talk about my journey and what I've learned and share that with people. One of the most amazing things that I've appreciated about the Michigan, about the UFM community is, is this network. You know, when I was, I, by the way, Renata, I graduated 2002, which is, uh, you know, quite a while back. Uh, and uh, 2002 was a difficult year to graduate because it was just right at the height of the recession. But the one distinct thing I remember is reaching out to alumni, cold and saying, hey, uh, I'm looking for a job. And the number of Michigan Wolverines that reached out with it within Ross or just the broader Michigan uh, you know, community we have was pretty phenomenal. So I distinctly remember that. And it's, it's a very special, it's a very tight-knit community. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my background. So I, I lead, the, I'm, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Petco. I lead strategy, planning, mergers and acquisitions and ventures at Petco. I've been at Petco for a little more than three years. Prior to this, I pretty much most spent most of my career doing strategy in different industries. Did you know? Did a little bit of consulting uh, before I came to Ross. Then did strategy mergers and acquisition in financial services and tech, and quite a few different things. And Petco has been my first first role in retail, but I've absolutely enjoyed it. Uh, and 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 looking forward to talking more. Uh, and, uh, you know, Renata, back over to you. Yeah, so the format here is going to be like, I'm going to ask some questions, but I really encourage you guys to put some questions in the chat and we are going to go um, over them as, um, as we can here. So we want to make this as interactive as possible. Well, the first question actually is, how did you become a CSO? That's a really deep question. Uh, to be completely, you know, to be completely candid, I, I, you know, if you look at my career and you look at the opportunities and things that I've had, it's had its twists and turns. I've, I've been in some amazing, amazing roles and amazing teams. I've been on teams that I wasn't that thrilled to be a part of and wasn't motivated, but it's been a journey of many, many, many different sort of twists and turns and learning and opportunities. You know, I, I, I did some thinking on this, and this is a really deep question. I would say there's a couple of different themes when I look back at how I've grown in my career. I would say there are, if you will, four controllable factors and one sort of uncontrollable factor. I'm going to get the last one out of the way first, the uncontrollable factor. With everything you do in life, there's always this thing called opportunity slash chance slash luck slash coincidence, whatever you call it. Sort of that's not controllable. Sometimes, but that, that, that always exists for many, many, many different people in terms of how their careers have navigated. Uh, even, even when I look at Petco, uh, 
we've done really well, but coming into Petco three and a half years back, when, we, when I was coming to Petco, we were competing with Amazon, we were competing with Chewy, we were competing with some really, really big established players in the industry uh, that, that are all participating in the category we are in. So there's, there's a good deal of the opportunity, chance, uncertainty, but I would say in terms of four factors that I believe that are controllable, uh, the first one was I did a lot of deep thinking on what do I really like to do in life? And what sets me apart? What am I good at? And what do I really like to do? And often the Venn diagram of what am I good at and what do I really like to do might be an interesting one. But I did, I've done a couple of different roles in my life. I've done product for new businesses. I've done a little bit of marketing, a little bit of product marketing. And what I came back to is I really like doing strategy. I really like thinking long term. I really like the problem solving aspect of it. So the first thing was just recognizing and understanding what do I really like to do? That was, I think, the first big thing for me. The second connected piece is how do I find a place that values what I'm good at and can provide me an opportunity to grow? And it's a combination of looking at industries where the capability and what do you want to do is valuable and even a company within, within that. Often you look at strategy teams, strategy teams play different roles in different companies. But what I started exploring and thinking through is what are the kind of companies which should value strategy? And these are companies that are looking to grow, looking to disrupt, looking to lead, and has a management team and particularly a CEO where she or he is really committed to driving growth. The third piece of it was finding great people to work with. And I know you hear about the word great people, but it's not just having a great, great manager that can stretch you and help you grow. It's finding people that you enjoy working with and learn and respect with. And that becomes a really important play is, is finding people who you respect, at least 80%, 90% of it, there's always going to be people you don't like. But if you look at the vast majority of people, do you respect them? Do you like them? Do you enjoy working with them? And do they help you learn? whether it's a manager, whether it's the pe people around you and the people uh, above and below your organizational levels. And then finally, the fourth one I would say is, and this is something that uh, a, a mentor told me one, but give 110%, just consistently give 110%, not 100, not 95. Do over and above everything you've been asked to do. And it's something I've taken because if everyone's doing 100%, you will stand out doing 105. So do a little over and above what you're doing. So if you're doing a body of analysis, add a little piece that is connected to it, but that was not considered. Uh, so give 100%. So coming back to, I think, you know, what really helped me navigate my career is doing some deep internal introspection and thinking on what do I really, really like to do and what works? How do I find a home, a professional home, a professional place that can help me grow? How do I work with great people? And how do I you know, across those three, how do I consistently give better than 100% over time? Uh, let me pause there and see if you have any follow-up questions or anything I can help answer a little bit more. Yeah, so I think that you, you just summarize like the four areas. So find what you like to do, find a place where you are able to do it, find great people, work hard. At some point in your career, looking back, did you have the CSO position as like the North Star? As you figure out that strategy is what you like to do. Strategy was absolutely what I really came back to. Uh, CSO position was, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was, I would say it was a North Star, but it was not something, you know, there isn't a predictable set of chess moves to get there. It was like, I'm going to do the best. I'm going to find a great environment and do the best I can and try to grow. Uh, but CSO, I would say, was was a North Star. There wasn't a clear sort of roadmap on how do I get there. It was a lot of interesting twists and turns, but there was always a North Star. So I know where I'm headed. I might not get to it straight. Uh, but, but I love strategy, and that's what drove my aspiration of if there's something I want to do, I want to be a strategy leader, and I want to help work with people and help work with companies to make a difference. So that was clearly absolutely what I like to do. And Renata and, and, and everyone over here, part of it was doing roles which are really, really great and important roles and realizing I may not be very good at it or I'm not as motivated by it. Mm -hmm. So I have a, I'll give you one example. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that know how to do very disciplined process. Like, you know, put a process in place and execute the same process over and over again. Tremendous amount of respect. That is not me. I don't do it very well. 
So recognizing what do I do well and what sets me apart and where do I find a, a place that can value it became, became really important in that journey. Yeah, that makes sense. At some point, did you ever make a plan to get to, to the CSO position or it just happened as you were working hard? I think it just happened. And it's a coin, you know, it, 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 I, I wanted to grow. So one of the things is I wanted to grow. So that's, I think, one of the active. So more than even saying I want to be a CSO, what I said is I want to grow. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that what I do today and what do I need to do tomorrow to keep moving and growing became, became really important. And, and, and so that's something that I actively looked at and actively looked out for. So one of the big, big areas of mentorship and coaching and thinking I've done is how do you develop the next set of skills for you to grow? And that becomes an interesting one and a tricky one. And for me, it's different waves across different levels in your career. You start off by doing, you know, what do you consider problem solving? Doing a body of work that you do. And you do it really well. But then you start talking about how do you lead other people to do the work that you've been doing, that you've been very good at? And how do you make sure they live up to your standards? And then you sort of evolve beyond that and saying, how do you take other people's work but and, and go beyond and start to influence where the company goes and where the team goes. So it's that stages of evolution of how you go through. And that's something that I've proactively thought and, 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 and talked to people. And, you know, having mentors, having people that you respect, give you feedback and give you ideas on what works was really powerful in that journey. Because one of the things they tell you is what got you successful, what is getting you successful today is not going to be the only thing you'll need in the next role. You will need to do that and more. So it's the ability to develop and grow. So particularly in the journey of strategy, you know, what got me successful when I was starting on my career in strategy was the usual suspects that you see in any strategy role, whether it be in consulting or whether it be in a corporate, a corporate role, which is you have to be really good at problem solving. So how do you take a complex problem, simplify it, bring, bring clarity to it, focus the problem, and back it up with the framing and analysis to, to, to answer the problem? How do you then collaborate? So that's what, something you do when you start off in your career. As you develop on, the second, third couple of different things you start to add is how do you collaborate across the organization to go to your problem? So you're not just solving a piece of the problem, you're then working across different teams. Then you add on, how do you present that recommendation and get people to buy in into your recommendation? And it's not just building a PowerPoint, it's actually figuring out what your audience cares about and how do you engage your audience? And over time, you know, I've built, I've, 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 I've sort of had mentors and I've done a lot of thinking on how do you develop the skills? So for me, what's important is you want to be a strategy leader and you want to be a chief strategy officer. I would say there's a couple of different things that, that, really, really helps, uh, really has helped me uh, when I look back in time. One was, you know, building your reputation as a trusted advisor. Strategy is a role where, a strategy is about making choices. It's about making prioritized choices. It's what are the 95 things you're not going to do to do the five things very, very well as a company. And strategy is about choices. If you're making choices, You've got to be able to stand in front of a really difficult audience and explain to them why are those choices good? Why are we not trading off? So for example, you could go to a person who owns a function and she may really care about investing more in a function and you might be going and telling her, well, you know, that's not an area you want to invest in, you want to invest somewhere else. But the ability to do that with, with data, discipline, and conviction becomes important. So how do you be a trusted advisor that people trust what you're doing? So one thing that I learned from a leader said, you may not be liked, but you should be respected. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be liked because you're making choices as a, as a strategy leader. But as long as you're respected and people know what you do, you stand for the company and you stand for what's right for the company, that becomes important. I would say the second big thing that I've learned and grown is how do you be bold and visionary? Mm -hmm. Strategy is also about, you know, the choices that drives winning. So how do you be bold and visionary and inspiring other people to follow the lead? So one critical role in strategy is how do you get people to rally and believe what's five years out when people are going through it? And for a lot of us, when we live through today, you're looking at a macroeconomic environment that is softening. You look at inflation, you look at elevated energy prices for the near future, if not even medium term. But how do you then shift the focus and talk about the next five years? And how do you inspire and engage confidence in 
Let's focus five years out. That's where we want to go. And here's how we're going to get there. The third piece of it, I would say, is bringing, and again, comes back to the choices piece, is bringing focus and clarity to what the company does. Mm -hmm. So I would say there's a lot of things different people want to do. There's a lot of things the companies want to do. But how do you become, how do you get that focus? And how do you make sure it's simple and clear? Simplicity and clarity is one of the things. And I've learned this from, uh, I was reading, a, I was, you know, uh, Satin Nadella is a leader I tremendously respect. Uh, he is, he is he's, he's just absolutely inspiring. And this is a word I'm, I'm, I'm taking from his book, uh, which is clarity. And he talked about great leaders being clarity. It's how do you make something complicated really simple? And I think that's an important role that I play is how do you look at many, many, many different things, prioritize and make it simple. So I would say the skills that have helped me grow is building a reputation as a trusted advisor, someone who looks up for what's right for, for the company and someone who looks up what's right, being bold and visionary, and bringing focus and clarity to situations and environments and choices, whether it be the long-term strategy, whether it be planning, whether it be an acquisition we're looking at, but across different forums, how do you bring focus and clarity? Great. No, you just gave us a lot of good information. You talked about skills, you talk about mentorship, you talk about trust, you talk about uh, vision, you talk about like, inspiring people, and I want to unpack some of those, but we have some questions here in the chat. So. Please. One from Asha is, how did you frame conversations with your leadership around your desire for growth? There was, I, I would, I would, uh, that's a really, really deep question. I would say there were three different things that, that, that were happening in terms of framing my conversation. One was the background of delivering or delivering above and beyond what I was asked to do. So if you're delivering 100%, uh, I always try to deliver a little more. So whatever body of work you're doing, you build a reputation you want to do more. So I think that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is carving out and recognizing that there is an opportunity for you to grow. And third is asking for help and support across different people in the community and in the place you work and how do you develop and grow further. So I would say all of these three things have, have really helped me have conversations, which is number one is showing that you can you, you have potential to grow, which is doing more than what you've been asked to do. Number two is figuring out what the roadmap and the path is to grow and how, how do you get there? And three is then asking for mentorship, support, help, and carving out, if you will, the roadmap of how do you learn and grow further and asking for people to support you in that journey. As one example, there was no strategy function when I came to Petco. Uh, and so I built up a strategy function. I showed the value of what a strategy function brings to Petco. And we started focusing on a couple of different things. We started focusing on here's what the five-year vision looks like. Here's the turnaround strategy when we first came in. Here's how do we take that and make it into a rigorous annual planning process. And here's how we then do a lot of strategic investments to go enable that. And that eventually led the value of, this is a function we want to invest in. This is a set of people we want to invest in. This is, a per this is the person who leads the function, me, that we want to invest in. And so proving that th there is value and there was clearly value in going and doing it absolutely helped that journey. Yeah, so I think that one skill that you didn't mention, but you probably have it, uh, it's like ab ability to sell your vision to the company and to the people that you're working with, because you're basically you're selling that strategy is yeah. great. And also that you should have a team and that you should be doing that. I think that when I think about the MBA curriculum, I kind of, I feel that we don't have a, like enough sales classes, but I feel that that's a very good skill that's needed. I would, I would say, I would say also inspiring mm -hmm. and, and convincing. And part of one of the things that I have done, which has helped me is I maybe, I, 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 may, I may tend to overdo it, but I spent a lot of time thinking about the person I'm speaking to or the group of people I'm speaking to, what do they care about? Who are they? What's their background? What do they care about? And how, mm -hmm. so three things, what's their background? What do they care about? And how do they go about processing and making decisions. And so thinking about those three things is what their background, what do they care about? What do they care about could simply mean what are they incentive with? Mm -hmm. uh, so if someone is asked, you know, if someone has a focus of cutting costs and you go to them, but let's go spend money, 
this is always going to be contradictory. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming back and saying, let's go spend money because we will save a lot of money later might be a better way to understand that. So understanding what incentivizes mm -hmm. people and what drives people and how they look at information and process decisions becomes good. So for example, even on the long-term strategy piece, you're going to walk into a room where you have the CEO who wants to talk about what's right. You have divisional leaders that are all looking for how do I drive growth in my businesses? Mm -hmm. And then you have the functional leaders, whether it be marketing or finance, that have very different viewpoints uh, on what they care about. But understanding how people think about the thing differently, their areas differently, and how they think about what you're presenting differently absolutely helps. Yeah, I think that is a very, very important point because it's all about relationships, right? End of the day. It's, it's absolutely, absolutely a lot of it is about relationships. And it's almost like I've sat down with all of the leaders and all of the people I work with, grab coffee and say, tell me how do you, tell me a little bit about your background. Tell me how you like to approach mm -hmm. uh, business cases or opportunities. How do you think about, you know, what's, uh, how do you think about making decisions and what's important to you? What are your three to five most important things you do? And often that conversation and that building the relationship helps because then you understand how people approach it and how people think about it differently. That's, I think, one of the best advice that everybody in this call can start doing today. Uh, that is actually asking those questions. So to me, I, I don't feel I'm doing great. So I, I do think that this is a very tactical that like when you go talk to people, if you want to get promoted, for example, try to understand what is their goal for their for the organization before you go and try to sell yourself. Um, again, everybody take note on this one. I think it's a very important one. And Renata, if I may add to that, one thing that has helped me coming into retail, I'm new to retail. I'm three and a half years into retail. Uh, maybe a little more than that if I'm doing my math right. But I'm new to retail, uh, but one of the things that, I, that has helped me build credibility with people in retail uh, that have been here 10, 20 plus years is a couple of different things. Number one is I've spent time studying retail and this is like reading, but really focusing on who are the best companies in retail and what do they do differently? So reading and easy stuff, look at the investor presentations, look at annual reports, look at the organization structures, look at their filings and get a sense of how you know, what's important and how they're driving growth. How are retailers growing? The second thing is actually, there's really no sub substitute for it. I spent time going and working in our Petco stores. Mm. So I'd actually go spend three days. And by the way, Ann Arbor happens to be a great place for me to go do stores because of course it's, you know, it's, it's, it's back in, back in the UFM line, but take a couple of cities and go work in this. I, it took, took a couple of different cities across the country and went and worked in stores. It was humbling to realize the complexity of what it takes to work in a store. Uh, you're meeting with customers, you're working with the, 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 you know, the trucks that have arrived and you got to, you know, offload the trucks and start to put stuff in, in, in shelves. So it was, that helps you build respect the people that have done that in the industry for quite a while. And I think that that's certainly something that helped me. Yeah, that's a that's very very interesting because sometimes we think that executives are just thinking the top, the industry, and like the partners. But actually, you went to understand how that happens in in, in real life, like how people go to the stores, they choose their products, how the products are delivered um, as a baseline. That is, I think, another good advice for people who want to grow. So there's another question here. You were talking a lot about mentors and how mentors were important in your career. So Christian is asking if there were mentors who have guided you uh, to prepare for every stepping point in your career. Abs the answer is absolutely. The answer is absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I would say the mentors that I've had, they were in a couple of different buckets. Of, 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 of things that I've learned from mentors. Number one, and the most valuable mentorship that I think I've had is how do you, is, is the bigger theme on leadership, is how do you grow and how do you grow to invest back in people that work as part of your team? So how do you become an effective leader? And I think that's, that's some tremendous mentorship that I've received because you know leadership, there are a lot of books, a lot of different things, but speaking to 
people that are exceptional leaders that really help me understand, understand the piece of it. And so the stages of how you go through in your career, what is expected at different levels and how do you continue to grow became really important. So I think that that's one piece of it is speaking to people that help you as a leader. The second set of people I've mentored and talked to are people that help me in my function, which is strategies. How do you think about this? How do you navigate it? And, and, and as you've grown, as I've, as I've grown in my career, it's been less of how do I solve this problem, which is always important, mm -hmm. but how do you engage a difficult audience? How do you talk about something that is disruptive that people in the rest of the organization are struggling to accept? And so this becomes the whole idea of inspiring and leading and, and, and painting a longer term vision. The third group of mentors and people that I've talked to have really helped me on understanding the industry. So I would say my mentors have been one about people and leadership. The second being about my function is how do you be a more effective strategy leader? And the third has been around the industry of like, tell me more about retail. Uh, tell me more about the digital platforms that drive retail and consumer. And I, it's been these combination of mentors and, you know, mentorship can mean many different people, things to people. It can be something that's fluid. It can be something that's pretty formal. Most of my mentors are, you know, are pretty fluid. I reach out to them, but I make it a proactive effort to reach out to them every three months and saying, hey, can I grab you for coffee or can I spend 30 minutes? I've got a couple of ideas I want to run through with you and I'd like to get some advice. And it's, it's, it's always humbling and powerful. The one, thing, the one thing I would probably say what great mentors are, are they're honest. Mm -hmm. And you built a relationship of trust and they're, they're able to tell you very honestly what matters. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the things. Seek out mentors that are honest. You may not like what they're saying, but if they're honest and you're welcoming of their feedback, that absolutely helps. Yeah. I personally like I have a hard time identifying and keeping mentors, especially like when they move to different organizations or I move to different divisions. Uh, do you have any advice on how to really keep the relationship with mentors as you establish them? I would say take the onus on putting it on a calendar. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I live off my calendar. I live off of Outlook or whatever the choice is for all of you. So I, I, I'll put reminders, but more importantly, I would say taking a step back, you know, Renata, mentors who were mentors five years back may not be the right mentor for you today, mm -hmm. based on what you're looking to learn and evolve. I, you know, when I was in tech, I had a lot of mentors where I understood tech. I'm still in touch with them once in a while, but you know, I've actively seeked out mentors that help me understand retail and consumer goods. So you would, you would expect a mentor to evolve across phases in your career of what you're trying to learn, the level of leadership you're aspiring to, and the domain that you want to get some grounding and depth on. So I would say, you know, and, and again, it doesn't need to be a very formal mentorship process where every month you sit down and there's a calendar, but there has to be some level of recurrence and, 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 and ownership of reaching out and engaging. Yeah, no, I think that is very valuable. So let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, and we're going to talk about strategy. You said that you really enjoy thinking about the long-term strategy. So how do you split your energy and team effort between the short-term and the long-term strategies? Like for example, the focus on sustainability that Petco has. Absolutely. And this has been one of the fascinating things that I've had the great, great, great honor and opportunity to build out at Petco uh, is what we do is we've built a cadence around how do you do strategy? So what we do within Petco, and I'll give you an example, is for any business to grow, if for any business to grow, you need a combination of core businesses. You need a combination of something I call adjacent, and there are many different terms for it, adjacent, and then you need a, com they need a couple of longer term high growth bets. What core is, it's predictable markets, you have competitive advantage, you have competitive differentiation, not just advantage, and you're winning in those places. What adjacent is, you take some of the core and you add one dimension of risk, not multiple dimensions of risk. As an example, it's a product, you're taking it in a different channel, could be an adjacent business. So you add moderate risk and there is line of sight in the next three years for that business to grow. And then you look at long-term growth, and I'll give you some examples of what we are looking at within Petco in, 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 in terms of growth. Uh, which is 
five to 10 years out, and that's a portfolio. So what we've done as a company is actively manage which of these are core adjacent and growth and how do we track them. For growth, putting in revenue and profitability might be a little too early. So what we look for is customer adoption. We look at different metrics, but eventually all of them need to come in and talk about what is what are choice points on which we know these are credible businesses to further invest in and what are the cutoffs? And then how does it translate to you know, monetization metrics, whether it be revenue or something else? So I would say that'd be the thing. What we've done is we've taken that format and applied an annual cadence within Petco on how do we do it. So what we focus on at the start of the year is our, you know, we focus on the long-term strategy. We focus on refreshing what five, seven years out looks at Petco. So we look at, you know, the portfolios of businesses we're in, uh, how each one of them delivers growth and what the five-year journey looks like. But then what we do is we take that five-year journey, double click on the next year and develop something called annual operating plan. So we develop one for all of Petco, and then we work with the different businesses and functions to create their own plan. And then we partner with finance to help build the budgeting process. Mm -hmm. Sort of an end-to-end -end cycle. So uh, as an example, summer is a long-term strategy, fall is annual operating planning, and early stage of late fall and early winter is the budgeting cycle. And that gets us ready for the next year. So dedicating cadence and all of these, the big, big, big milestones we look for are the board meetings, the board of directors meeting, where we report out what we're doing. So we put that cadence in where we focus the time across the year based on these. Between these, we also do some you know, different one-off consulting assignments, internal consulting assignments that feed into all of these. But putting in a structure and process has really helped us focus on what's important. So what we do is we walk back from the fiscal year and say, and, and I built this cave itself. Yeah, no, that, that's very helpful. Has anything changed after the IPO that now you have to really report to the street on a quarterly basis versus before that potentially you could be thinking long-term more? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, being part of the journey of Petco, being private, and then becoming part of, and I, I, I had the incredible opportunity to be part of the core IPO team was just an absolute joy, right? What being a private company really helped when we were you know, underperforming was help set a bold and aggressive strategy and invest in areas that it becomes hard as a public company to do because you're reporting out every quarter. So that, that, that journey of taking care of the fundamentals, fixing the fundamentals, and then becoming a public company and attracting investors that, that, that appreciate a story and also see that you've actually delivered on your new strategy when you were private, builds a credibility. I would say post IPO, three big things that have helped. One is we've shifted the company to operating more in a quarterly cadence. We used to do more annual, Renata, as you, as you just absolutely identified it. We've shifted to more, how do you think about planning and operating in a quarterly cadence? So planning used to be a big cycle a year. We do one big cycle and three mini cycles for the course of the year, just to help the quarterly. So you shift your focus to quarterly. The second thing that I think is absolutely got is pluses and minuses, but really pluses outweigh it. It gives more visibility to what you do as a company externally, whether it's your strategy, whether it's your people practices, whether it's how do you think about diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and how do you think about you know, sustainability metrics and what sustainability means for you as a company, it brings more visibility. So as a public company, you get more oversight, you get more visibility. And there's obviously pluses and minuses, but I think the pluses really, really help because it helps your investor community see what you're about and see mm -hmm. what they care about. And so it builds either confidence on what you're doing or you get very clear feedback on what you're not doing. But the transparency and visibility helps your investor community and your broader stakeholder community understand what you, what you exist and what you're about. The third, I think, which has been really useful is with the investors we've gotten and we've gotten more capital to accelerate growth. And I think that's been the more important piece of it is we've got more capital now. Uh, we've got more money, to put it simply. And so we're investing more in accelerating our growth ventures which is a lot of organic growth. You know, we were focused on pet healthcare as one of our growth vectors. We also focused on very targeted, you know, programmatic strategic m and to help accelerate that growth. But it just gives you more capital to, to accelerate what you, where you want to invest your growth in. So I would say, you know, three big things post IPO is the shift to quarterly. The second is visibility into the company and what it does and building confidence with the investor community. And third is just more capital to accelerate where we want to invest in growth. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful to understand like the pre and post IPO process. So you mentioned that you have the plan in the quarterly planning, but I imagine that some of the strategies that you put in place may not produce the results that you expect. So how do you know uh, when to pivot and how do you make sure that like the team is actually supporting you? We talked about inspiring the team, uh, but like, how do you know um, it's the right time to change? Absolutely. Renat had a really, really, really powerful question. And one of the key actions that help Petco focus is how do you know when things are not working? So one of the first things that I had an opportunity to do, and I came in uh, in late 2018 when Petco was going through some headwinds, is we looked at the portfolio businesses mm -hmm. and there were, there were businesses that were not delivering. And there were new initiatives that were not delivering. So what we've done since then is, and this comes back to process a little bit and discipline a little bit. But right now, what we do is we've done, you know, four different things that have helped look at understanding how do we look at new businesses, which I know we'll come back and answer your specific question. Number one is for anything we do, we need a business case. We put in a process where we have a business case. And a business case is what customers are you going after? Are there competitive, you know, what products are you doing? What product services, what customers are you going after? Is there any proof or visibility or any research from customers that they care about this? And what about competition? And then how will the financials look? That's the first, first thing we look at it. The second thing we look at it is what are early stage KPIs that are going to be leading indicators to revenue, cross margin, EBITDA, the three most important metrics on a PL and, and, and maybe cash flow. But so one of, the, one of the sets of metrics that I really like is customer. Mm -hmm. How many customers like your product? And it may be too early to look at margin and revenue, but how many customers like your product? What kind of customers like your product? And also in the early stages, targeted surgical research, whether it's surveys or just sitting down and talking to a few customers and why do you like the product? Is it really aligned with the business case and hypothesis we do? And so what we do for new businesses is we have this business case process and a financial model process. We go through a stage approval and every three months we look at a, a set of KPIs and metrics and how they're evolving. In about six to nine months, they need to start evolving to more predictable PL metrics of revenue, margin, and EBITDA. For some of the businesses, it could be even two years out, but customer metrics are really, really important and humbling. And I think that's one of the big things that help Petco. And when I look at brilliant retailers that inspire me, customer, it's focusing on customers, the obsession with customers. Customers will tell you whether they like your product or not in retail very, very quickly. So shifting the focus to let's look at customer metrics and those customer metrics need to lead into revenue metrics and margin metrics eventually. Yeah, no, I think that's helpful. And you mentioned business case multiple times here. We have a question that's actually aligned to like tools that you use. So Rafael is asking, He's saying like that uh, MBA programs of, often introduce us to tools like balance of scorecards, value proposition canvas, use case, et cetera. Do you find yourself going back to any particular tools, resources for their usefulness for strategy development? We know business cases you use. <laughs> Absolutely. So balance scorecard is critical. Uh, so what it's, it's thematically the exact set of themes that you've start, we've all studied at MBA. Uh, mine is 20 years back, so it's pretty dated. But it's the exact same themes of components that you've looked at. So the big thing is what do you look at? And, and I'll simplify this quite a lot. Uh, but in a business case, it has to be what is, the, what is the product and what is the market and what are customers and competitors? That sort of foundational aspect of it. And then two, what are you going to do to win and differentiate? And often I say this and people sometimes laugh at it, but the four P's are pretty helpful. And you can make fun of the four P's, but what's your product? What are you going to price it at? Why are you pricing it at the pricing? How are you going to promote it? And how are you going to sell it? And it's, you could call it by different things, but those components of what's your product? Why are customers going to buy it? How are you going to price it and sell it? And, and those components really help. The other thing that helps, which is going to the finance side of the house, is having people, forcing people to build out a financial model, a five-year financial model. Mm -hmm. Because then you actually start to talk about revenues. Okay, revenues, it could be as simple as number of customers times 
price per customer or our, our you know spend per customer but forcing people to think about the different line items of a P standard pnl you don't even need to go to a cash flow statement for a new business case but even thinking about it really helps because if you talk about i want to get 10 million customers in five years well how are you going to get the 10 million customers because further down you don't have a line item for marketing that is talking about so forcing the rigor of building a pnl in addition to the business as part of the business case, I think absolutely helps. And then aligning on what KPIs really feed into the business case. So for example, if you said year one, I'm not gonna be profitable, but I'll have 300,000 customers, then that becomes your KPI. What were you tracking on year one? It's how you're tracking two, 300,000 customers and how you're tracking a spend per customer. So the two, three levels deeper within the PL really help. So I would say the fundamentals of a business case in terms of market customer competitor, what are you going to really win and, 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 and grow? A financial case really helps set the stage and key metrics from the financial model that, that feed into how you track and grow your business. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that your approach also make your stakeholders happy because like you have the financial guys very happy because they're building all the financials and then you have the marketing team really happy because you were focusing on the customer <laughs> and probably, probably the product team who is trying to figure out how to measure the KPIs also happy. So I'm pretty sure that's absolutely. a very like, collaborative approach. And Renata, the three areas we absolutely focus on the functional side of the house are number one is marketing, how much marketing support you need and how much money would that be? Number two is tech, IT, how much IT will you need? And number three is people, the HR side of the house. So if you're gonna be hiring, what's the line item of how many people you're gonna hire, when and what kind of people? And so once the business case, and we have a couple of stage gates, but we have people from these three organizations weigh in and, 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 and collaborate on creating the business case which is, you know, the HR team has to sort of either buy, buy in into your recommendations or say, here's where we disagree, which is we don't either need the people or we don't need the new capability. And the same thing with marketing and, and, and IT. Yeah, that's awesome to really understand how the organization works um, on making these decisions. So we have another question here from Christian. Um, so with the pandemic, how has um, your approach, strategy, especially communicating and working with others in the C-suite has shifted to make sure that you can achieve your goals? Um, and then for example, considerations of ESG uh, metrics for the need to consider like public health um, in your strategy. Absolutely, so two really important questions out there. So the pandemic, was completely uncertain. We started the pandemic at Petco thinking, wow. And I, I joined late 2018. And when I joined, I was just chatting with Renata. I told my wife, hey, we're competing with uh, Amazon, Walmart, some really big competitors. We, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a tough hill to climb. And we made progress in 2019 and then the pandemic happened. And the big question was, okay, how do we navigate now? But there's a couple of different things that really helped us navigate through the pandemic. One was being focused on the customer. Is why would customers come to Petco during the pandemic and how do we make it easier for the customers? So one big thing is when we had to just close our stores for a little while, we set up something called curbside delivery, really, really overnight. So a combination of, you know, I would say the execu executing through the pandemic was number one was focusing on the customer and two, being incredibly agile. We put together this thing called curbside in a matter of two weeks. And the idea of curbside is you pull up next to a Petco store, we'll drop a bag of food in your trunk and you drive away. So you don't even need to enter the store, people are really apprehensive of the pandemic, but it came back to what do customers care about? What do our customers care about? And what do the other customers care about? And how do you go deliver this as seamlessly and easily as you can? On the people side, it came back to over investing in engaging and communicating. It's hard to engage over Zoom or it's hard to build new relationships over Zoom, but investing more time in talking to your teams, talking to other teams, showing up in other people's team meetings and talking about issues and challenges they're facing really, really helped navigate through the pandemic because you know, a lot of what you expect and take for granted is in, in, in a normal office function got completely disrupted. And as we sort of coming back to what, you know, we call the new world, new normal of how we all work and play, which is hybrid, recognizing that over investing and engaging and communicating, communicating became, became really important as you navigated through it. So those are, those are, I would say the two big things of what helped us navigate uh, 
through the pandemic on the business side of the house is, you know, focus on customer, 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 and be really agile in meeting their needs. The second in terms of the people side of the house is engaged in talking and engaging across not just your team, but other teams as well. People are facing a lot of pressure uh, during the pandemic, people struggling with uncertainty, but talking and elevating issues and recognizing there's things we need to do, I think absolutely help. On the ESG side of the house, uh, ESG has been very, very important uh, for Petco. We're really committed to doing what's right for, we call it people, pets, and planet are the three big things we care about. The interesting thing, what's happened is since late November, uh, the importance of ESG and particularly sustainability is elevated up and we're working through what else do we need to do? So we, I, 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 I have sustainability as part of my scope and I have a leader who runs sustainability for us. We made very good progress in sustainability. Our chief HR officer and her organization has been phenomenal in driving DINB and programmatic DINB and understanding why is it that we don't have enough communities of certain people? And let's look at data, let's look at analysis and then go back to solve it. Is it people don't know about us? People don't like us as much? People don't apply? We're not able to convert people? We don't grow people? So if you look at the end-to-end -end life cycle of, of, of talent, We've taken a very data-driven programmatic approach and that's absolutely helped in terms of how do we go solve the sort of S part of it. And G, you know, we've, we're, we've always been strong in governance uh, and we've improved what it means to be better governed uh, as we become a public company. But I would say ESG has become very critical. It matters to investors today, which has been great because you can make a business case behind it, but it also matters to our customers and it also matters to the people who work at Petco, my peers and, and, and the family of, of Petco people. Uh, a lot of people that come into Petco say, I really care about, I, I came to Petco because I know what you do for, you know, Petco Love is a foundation that saves a lot of pet lives. We really care about what you do at Petco Love and how you save half a million pet lives every year from euthanasia and working with different rescues and, and, and different places. So ESG matters to multiple different communities and there's work to be done. We made progress and we'll continue to commit and drive more across all of the ESG vectors. But, but having investors and our, our, our Petco employees and our customers care about it goes a long way in reinforcing the value ESG brings to us. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's very, very interesting to know how you guys are progressing in ESG. I think it's interesting topic. Everybody's like want to talk about it, but sometimes the companies are just struggling to, to meet the goals. We're all, to be completely honest, Renata and I am honored to sit on an ESG council with other retail leaders. We're all navigating through uh, it. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a very clear commitment of we need to reduce our impact on the environment. We need to take care of the planet uh, as one. But how do we go about doing it? And how does everything, how does the complexity of everything come together? It becomes, it's, it's just something we're all working through. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, there is but we're committed to, to, to moving and we're committed to making a difference. Yeah, so aligned to this, um, we have a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, and they are mentioning the supply chain challenges that has exacerbated with the COVID-19. So you're trying to reduce your carbon footprint, but at some point you're not even getting your goods, uh, but it's even worse. Um, so the questions are, are around like how you, you build like the, the risk um, in strategic planning, especially about like supply chain and also how you have those conversations um, with the, the COO, the CFO to make sure that you get like long-term alignment, not only short-term. Absolutely. So supply chain has been a challenge uh, for the last two years. Uh, we've all living through it. A combination of supply chain, supply issues, inflation, you know, all of it added up has been a challenge. And inflation on supply chain, key, key sort of spend areas. Uh, very, very simply, what we've done is we've created mm -hmm. our short term, but we've created our long term goals in supply chain, optimizing supply chain to take care of the short term. So it, it, it's, very, it's, it's a very clear trade off of what we've done. We want to make sure that number one, our, our stores, have the right products. And so whatever it takes, whether it, it may not be the ideal model, but whatever it takes, we wanna make sure the stores have the right products so customers get the right product. So we've 
traded off longer term ESG and even, even, even sort of the best in class metrics goals to make sure short term is taken care of. The second thing we've done connected with that is what else do we need to do across the rest of Petco to be able to fund that? We need to make sure our supply chain is rising, the supply chain is going up. And that's the benefit of the quarterly planning cycle is where do we cut? What are the things we need to do? How do we manage expenses elsewhere to be able to fund what our supply chain team needs? And third is just very tactically, every Monday morning, uh, you know, the executive team, we get together and look at metrics. Supply chain is one of the key metrics. And the question for the supply chain team and the leaders, what can we do to help? We're here for you. Your metrics don't look good. We know, uh, you've, you've, you know, you haven't slept in four nights, but what can we do to help? And I think even, even that message of we're here to support you versus why aren't your metrics great goes a long way in reinforcing that we're all in this together. So that's, that's sort of what we've done to navigate supply chain. We're getting better every week, every day. Uh, we went through a very difficult time during the heart of the pandemic, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in uh, because when factories shut down to produce food, if, if you have pets, you realize that if your pet likes a particular kind of food, our dog loves one particular kind of food, he's not gonna switch that easily. You wanna make sure that the bag of food you get or that's the kind of food you get. So we work with our vendor partners, we work with supply chain to make sure we do the best we can. So again, really short, we've created our short, long-term goals for short-term optimization. And we've, you know, we've collectively come together as a team said, what does the supply chain mean, team need to succeed? And how do we make cuts and how do we do what we need to to support them? Yeah, that's, that's great to know. I think that most companies are, are suffering um, supply from supply chain issues and challenges and trying to learn how to navigate. So before going forward, I know we just have five minutes here and I'd love to give the opportunity for people to unmute yourself, ask a questions. We have had great questions coming up um, in the chat here, but if you guys want to unmute yourself and ask a question, feel free to do so. be shy. <laughs> I'll throw something out to get the conversation going. The one thing that really works for me, which is interesting because you read about how senior leaders sleep two hours a night and are on 24 seven. I take work-life balance pretty seriously. There's a book that I've read and, and my managers really coached me on this. It's called The Corporate Athlete. And the whole idea is if you don't have your mental balance and your balance at a good place, if you don't have your physical health at a good place, you're not going to succeed in anything. So family life is really important to me. So I'll throw two things out, which may sound a little crazy, but number one is I actually don't check my email till about eight in the morning because there'll be 50 emails I'll try to react to. So just don't get up in the morning, grab a cup of coffee, sit and chat with my wife or something, but just start a few day differently because once you log in, there'll be 30 million emails for all of us to respond to. The second thing I have humbly accepted is I need seven hours of sleep a night. There are people I know who sleep four hours. I need seven. Mm -hmm. But I think that's made me much more productive as a human being and as a leader and as a peer to everyone I work with is. So work-life balance. So The Corporate Athlete, it's a very simple book in terms of concept, but it's a really powerful book is if you don't take care of your own physical and mental state, you're not going to succeed uh, professionally. You're always, that's always going to drive Sorry, I see, I see a couple of questions I'm going to try to see. I think that's the, all the questions we already uh, went through those. But I, I love that you were talking about work-life balance because that's what I do on my, my side. I talk about uh, wellness and balance in my blog, ideas for divas. And I'm always thinking like, can we really succeed uh, prioritizing work-life balance? Because you have all these statistics that said that you are more productive if you actually sleep the eight hours. Uh, if you go for a walk midday for 10 minutes, you're going to be way more productive in the afternoon. So all those things, they really pile up to make you better. But we still don't see leaders saying that they do it. And I love that you say that you don't open your email until like 8 a.m., that you have like a morning routine, uh, because that's something that I, I try to preach to others. But it's good to, to have evidence that you were successful and you're able to do that. And, you know, there are different people that operate differently, but uh, 
what I've realized for me, what works best for me, and each one of you is unique, is when I'm focused, I'm 110% focused. What I'm not done, I try to switch off. Switching off is sometimes hard for me, mm -hmm. but switch off in the morning, even before a day starts and get a fresh look at what's important. So if I have like some work to do, for example, I would probably carve out a time and not even check email if I have some thinking to do. I would start my morning and not check email and then start on email because once you start, it's a flurry of emails that's going to come. It's, yeah, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard. I know that we are two minutes here. I want to make sure that we have time to thank you for your time. I think that everything that you said was like super insightful. I have learned a lot about retail strategy, building, building career, that wellness actually is important to be successful. Uh, and I hope that the others also have uh, learned a lot. So um, we got some good questions from the audience here and I hope that everybody enjoy, enjoy the event. Absolutely, Renata, thank you for hosting me. Just, just really appreciate an opportunity to connect back with the mission community. And, uh, you know, we're a really special community as uh, Michigan. So uh, thank you for being part of the community and Renata, again, thank you for sort of giving us opportunities for all of us to connect. Thank Have a great you. rest of the day, everyone. Go yeah. blue. Yeah, go blue. Happy Friday. Enjoy your weekend. Uh, and, and thank you. Thanks again. Thanks everybody for joining. Absolutely. You thank, you, thank you, everyone. Thank you.